Hello everyone, welcome to a new episode of Writing Tandem. I'm Vivian Kavam, your host today, and I have the pleasure of introducing two incredibly inspiring individuals. They are a son and mother team, Nicole Bartlett and Vincent Gristle, and they are the masterminds behind the delightful and very innovative Okukios. It's a unique culinary creation um, that's been frankly, just tantalizing taste buds since about 2021. They actually got started a little prior to that, so we'll dive into that a little bit, but became official in 2021. And today's episode is not just about their delicious hybrid of cookies and donuts, but also about their journey of entrepreneurship and just the dynamics of their family, because it is a very family run business. And this all started actually in Nicole's kitchen and has since then moved to a commercial kitchen at Kitchen Council. And they have dreams of, of just taking this even further to their own factory. So very, um, just very neat and inspiring family. And my guests today, they bring not only a, a raw and real story of innovation from the kitchen, but also just insights into turning challenges into opportunities. They have embraced dietary restrictions, the entrepreneurial leap, the unpredictability of 2020. So I'm excited to have you dive into the story of Okukios. And who knows, by the end of this episode, you might just have to hop online and order yourself some of their delightful cookie donut hybrid gluten-free deliciousness um, because they're just such really unique creations. So let's dive in. Let's get this conversation to started and just discover the magic that is going on behind Okukios with Nicole and Vincent. Let's go. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. I'm excited today to introduce Nicole Bartlett and Vincent Rissell. So welcome. Welcome to Writing Tandem. This is, of course, a podcast where we just explore inspiring stories and journeys of entrepreneurship. And you two have an incredible story with some really fun twists, I think. So Today, I'm just thrilled to have you guys on here, and you are the dynamic duo behind Okukios, which was founded, we were just talking about this, founded in 2021 as far as like officialness, but like we're going to talk about businesses often start before the official paperwork, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, but this is a family business, and there's some unique things about the business that I really want to chat with you guys about, especially because you are a duo and you're a family duo as well which this is fun because I had another um, guest on where it was a mother son duo and it was just really interesting to talk about like what that dynamic looks like. So be sure to spill all the beans. Don't hold anything back. Okay. We got you. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Um, so we're going to talk about, of course, delicious Okukios, which are, well, I'll let you guys tell us more about that. They're lovely and delicious. My mom has tried them and she thought they were great. And I want to talk a little bit too, just about advice that you have for other aspiring entrepreneurs out there. Does that sound good? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Cool. Cool. So, okay. So first of all, we need to level set here. What is Okukios? What are Okukios? Okukios are a hybrid between a cookie and a donut. So in 2019, when my brother formed a gluten sensitivity, we had to do a bunch of tests because he was getting rashes and a bunch of discomfort. Mm. And we figured out it was gluten. And he always loved donuts. We'd always get them from like Olsen's, not Olsen's, sorry, Olsen's and everything like that. So my mom tried to make a gluten-free donut, but it never worked. So mm-hmm. she made the elements of a cookie and a donut. And then eventually she added in high protein because he's a gym rat. Basically, it's a he wanted a, a gluten-free donut and I couldn't make one. Yeah. It kind of happened in lieu of that challenge. Now, you were baking quite a bit, right? I think we were talking a little bit about 2020, everything's on lockdown. You kind of went into the baking world as many people did. I feel like there's like a sourdough bread burst. People were like cooking and in the kitchen. It sounds like that was kind of the same for you. Yeah, it was. I was already baking at home because, you know, there were so many questions about what was going on, what was, where were things coming from? And then things were not stocked as quickly with all, everything going on with COVID. Mm-hmm. So I was trying to bake something that everyone would enjoy at my house. Right. Um, you know, and not being able to make cookies that everyone can eat was kind of a uh, struggle. Mm-hmm. So I had to find something that not only was gluten-free, but also all four of my boys would eat. Right. And that's, that's where it kind of started from. And that's kind of a big thing is my understanding. So 
I know a lot of us out there have, we either have gluten-free sensitivity or gluten sensitivity, I should say, and need to eat gluten-free. We have friends who do, parents who do, brothers, sisters. like this is something I think a lot of, touches a lot of people's lives. And you hit on something really important there. You can find gluten-free things, but they don't always taste good, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what yeah. was the experimenting process like for you as you were just figuring out for your own family? What did that look like? Well, I had a bunch of taste testers who were 100% honest or <laughs> brutally honest. So um, there was that factor. But then there was also the factor of, you know, not knowing anything about being gluten-free when I started this. There's a whole learning curve. Mm -hmm. um, and we tried like the one-to-one -one flowers. And when people say it's one-to-one -one and you can't tell a difference, I think that's a lie. Yeah. <laughs> um, my children didn't like the way it tasted. The, the textures were different. Um, get that grainy sort of feel. So that was kind of a, I was like, okay, that's not going to work for this household. Let's try to figure out something else. Um, and then I just kind of started doing some research on what I could do at home. I had my own little KitchenAid and okay. I was able to get the, uh, the grinder attachment to put on there. So I started like grinding up rice and Rice is such a fine flour that I didn't have much luck with. Plus, the nutritional value wasn't there. And then mm. the oats, and that gave us a good consistency. Um, but then I learned that Quaker oats weren't necessarily gluten-free. Um, right. Because, I mean, oats are gluten-free inher inherently. Um, however, with the processing, the glutinous grains that contaminate the oats make them not gluten-free. So then we had to find actual gluten-free oats. So... We switched over to the Bob's Red Mill and started grinding those at home with my little grinder. And it mm -hmm. um, took me about six months to get all like the ratios of the leavening agents right um, before we had something that was not necessarily a donut yet, but it was tastier than half of the other things. But I mean, we, threw away, <laughs> yeah. we threw away so much, um, so many different batches, but it was finally like, you know, I'm going to get this right. But although we never really got a donut, we got a cookie donut. So it's like cakey on the bottom and like a crispy cookie on top. And um, his youngest brother was mm -hmm. two at the time and he couldn't quite say his C's yet. And he was going around calling them Tutio's. And we're like, oh, what is a cookie -o? You know, and so that's kind of where the name came from. I um, love so, it. Yeah. So we ended up with uh, oat flour and kept practicing and took about six months to get that first one sort of right. That's awesome. So this whole time while you're experimenting, did you ever think at that point ever that this might turn into a business or was this really just for you and your, your boys? This was just me trying to make something at home that they would all like. It mm -hmm. was just kind of a challenge of its own. And then, we started making it so regularly that it ended up to a couple of family members and they're like, Oh, this is kind of good. And then, you know, at probably, gosh, I don't know how, mm -hmm. when we were kind of like, maybe this could be a business. I think the name when the two year old was calling them Tokyo's, I was like, that's such a cute name. You know, I was like, I, I like that. So um, I don't know at what point we decided it would become a business, but I think once we started getting feedback from other family members that it was good, um, then we were kind of like, maybe we have something here, but maybe they're just being nice. So, <laughs> you know, it was kind of that, that line where I was like, is this really good or is this good enough um, to actually pursue something bigger? But yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because you were essentially... I mean, this is first step of entrepreneurism, right? And starting a business is you identified a need. You saw a need mm -hmm. and you went, hey, I think I can come up with a solution to fill this need. And so that's so neat. And, and then obviously to realize like, okay, if we have this need, maybe other people have this need too. And then the product testing piece. I love that, how you're like testing it internally. Like we often do with ideas, right? We're like, okay, I'm going to keep this close to home. It's for us. And then you start letting other people try it. But I totally understand too. Like, are people just being nice? Are they just saying, you know, that this is a good idea? So how did you start to validate that it was truly a good idea and worth pursuing? Um, well, we gosh. talked to our first vendors, yeah. like at 13th Street, we brought them some before we were in Kitchen Council and we were like interested in selling there. And we explained to them, you know, we we're still under cottage law. But we wanted to see if there was a demand for it and if our family wasn't just like, you know, 
make us feel good about it. <laughs> um, we brought it to them, and she was really sweet, and she was like, okay. She was like, oh, my God. Let's go. Well, I don't know what this is, but I need this. Like, <sighs> I need to start producing this for us. And I was like, awesome. And then I was like, wait a second. I have to be in a commercial kitchen first. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> And um, so that's kind of where we kind of had to like er, pump the brakes and be like, okay, are we legally able to sell this to other businesses? Um, then we went and kind of down that rabbit hole and got all of our legalities kind of buttoned up and um, was able to move forward with them within the next month. Um, we got into kitchen council, got our LLC and mm-hmm. our permits, our food license. Um, and I was like, okay, we're back. Okay, we have flavors and we can deliver. Um, and our first delivery, I think, was, oh, my God. No, it was the worst one. Yeah, it was, um, <clears throat> we call it the. <laughs> we, um, it, it fell on Thanksgiving, and it was not a joyous celebration. Um, mm. We had just started baking with almond flour. Okay. And learning the new ovens at the kitchen. So ovens from in the kit, commercial kitchen run about 25% hotter than the ones at home. Or you have to cut the time 25%. And we didn't know that. Oh, yeah. So wow. also baking with almond flour. I always tell people if they have an afternoon to like frustrate themselves to bake with almond flour because it is very frustrating. It's a finicky. It's a very finicky yes. flour. Like if you have one thing off, it'll just. So why the decision? Okay, we need to talk about two things here, right? One, we yeah. need to talk about kitchen council, what it is, how it's supported you, um, and what that's been like. But then tell me, too, a little bit about what made you decide to lean into almond flour, even though it was so difficult. Well, I was trying. My mother-in-law, oddly enough, wanted a sugar cookie. Okay. And I couldn't quite get the consistency or the texture right with oat flour to make a sugar cookie. So that's kind of where that challenge came up. Um, So I started exploring other flours I didn't have to grind, which almond flour was one of the easier not easier ones to to use but one of the easier ones to get Mm -hmm. so you know i could just grab almond flour and try it that's you know one day it'll come out amazing and then the next day you can do everything exactly the same and it's completely different it'll be flat or it'll spread it's just a very um finicky flour but it makes an amazing sugar cookie it does it's very airy yeah and it's that's kind of where that came from because I couldn't get the sugar cookie out of the oat flour. So are you still using almond flour and have you, do you feel like you've kind of perfected it or do you have a lot of food waste? Cause I know for people who are thinking about starting a business in the food industry, that can be one of the big hurdles, right? Is the food cost and the food waste piece. So how have you navigated that? Um, well, we do still have food waste. We still have days where like we we're amazing. We got this we've we've nailed it and then the next week it just it, it doesn't it just doesn't make the same it, all because the weather and like we're on the second floor of a building so like also that's to take into account and just everything else so many humidity little, little factors that just add up and so yeah we do have a lot of waste um luckily we do have some partners that like to take our um mess ups and really okay so we've been able to kind of funnel those um, to them. How and did you discover that? That's such an innovative way. I mean, when you can do that, right? I, it makes me think of um, the Jelly Belly factory. Mm-hmm. I remember going there as a kid with my grandparents, and they had whole bins of what they called belly flops, um, mm-hmm. where they got merged together in funky ways. They came out the wrong color or whatnot. They still tasted great. And I was like, right. what a great way to still – you know, they sold them at like a bulk price, but they still recouped some cost. Yeah. So how did you discover being able to kind of sell the seconds, if you will? Well, it's sometimes the tops will come off. So it'll just be like the cookie top or the center. Um, they take it and they make ice cream. Oh, so yeah. they were buying just the full ones. And then they, we realized that they were just grinding them up anyways and they were like they don't need to be pretty or you know all packaged all nice like everything else so we were like well what about the mess ups and that just kind of was a conversation that kind of naturally happened from you know just just working with a partner over and over and then learning that they didn't necessarily need the pretty ones um, because they were gonna 
destroy them anyways. <laughs> right. What an important lesson, right? To be like mm -hmm. always asking your partners for feedback, figuring out what it is they're doing so you can find a better solution for them and possibly for you, right? Because I think about if they, if you were packaging them all pretty and you had all these things, that's a lot of work. And then if they were just going to have to unpackage them, like that's a lot of work on their end. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But, yeah. Not, but it's, it's always a collaborative effort. Sorry. Lights went out. <laughs> that's okay. No um, worries. So, you know, the collaboration is kind of where we've learned and grown the most was just kind of feedback from our partners. Like as far as like our display box, one of our business partners was like, you know, um, if you was able to deliver that with a, a box ready to go, you know, that would make it easier for me. And we're like, you know what, we'll do that for all of our partners. Um, and then like just other things as far as like color coding or packaging was just something that we did, but kind of making a key for them um, was helpful. You know, That's awesome. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about the Kitchen Council. We've mentioned it a couple times. That's a local resource to the Council Bluffs area. But I know that there are entities like this all over the United States that people can tap into. So tell me a little bit about the Kitchen Council, that model, and what it has done for you, and if you would encourage others to seek out similar models to work in. I don't think that there's another one like Kitchen Council. There's a other there's shared... The metro area. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's other shared kitchen spaces. Yeah, there's um, lots of ghost kitchens. Um, across the nation, there's a lot of these popping up where right. where you can move maybe from like a cottage type of model into something else where you have, you know, access to a commercial kitchen, whether that's through a membership or you're renting or you're buying in. Right. So tell me how Kitchen Council works. I think the difference is that their motto and their mission is to help startups help help startups start up. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of other commercial spaces, they're like, okay, here's a space. This is when you can be in. Um, but Kitchen Council is more collaborative. Like, what do you need? If we don't have the answers to a legal question or, you know, something that newer businesses have trouble finding, then they have resources that they can tap into, like the, the Iowa Chamber, the Omaha Chamber, um, where you can reach out and actually get counseling or guidance or pick someone's brain, like the small business center, um, to kind of help with certain things that, you know, you're not sure where you need to go to find an answer. So I think that's where they're different um, as far as other commercial spaces that you can rent. I wish there were more kitchen councils because mm -hmm. um, th there's such a need and that's the startup costs for a restaurant or a small business like us is so high that it it's take years to really have that transition without them. Yeah, that totally, I think that is a big piece, right? Especially as you're thinking about in the food industry, there's so much equipment that goes into it. Obviously there's mm -hmm. the food piece, there's labor. And then if you had, if you're thinking about having to set up an actual commercial kitchen, like you talked about moving from a cottage um, style into a commercial kitchen, which opens up a lot more possibilities for, for you to be able to sell, right? To mm -hmm. be able to reach into those. So talk to me a little bit about when you think about where Okokios is going and where it came from. We've joked before in some conversations we have like, it kind of was this accidental business, right? Mm -hmm. um, when you think about where it's going now, what are you most excited about? And are you in for the long haul? Like, is this what you really want to be doing? Yeah. I mean, I think that the more we see the need and the more that we have, you know, that interaction with our end customers where they try it and then they're like, thank you so much for making this. You have no idea how hard it is to find. That kind of gives us that motivation to keep going. What do you think? Especially during the farmer's market seasons, um, it's the most absolutely insane because – Currently, we have about 30 retail partners, so trying to fulfill that every week on top of doing one to four markets a week, every single week from May until August, September, sometimes yeah. even October, it's pretty insane because like I won't be able to see like any of my friends or anything like that. And they're like, why are you doing this to yourself? Like it's like 100 hour weeks does not sound fun, but like just going to the markets and being able to have the face to face with people and then them trying a sample. Like we have like a, I wouldn't say a running joke, but like 
like a running thing where our return celiac, celiac customers will come up and they'll start dancing and in front of people at the market and the people at the market are like, what are you doing? And they're like, this is like one of the only things I can eat and I enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Like Cookie O's is here. They start dancing. We're like, yay, they love it. They still like their stuff. You know? well, that feels um, amazing. Yes. I mean, we would eventually mm-hmm. love to have a factory of our own um, that's dedicated gluten-free um, facility to where, you know, we can produce or mass produce, you know, regionally and then hopefully nationally at some point. Yeah. Um, you know, that would be kind of like the, the dream, the end goal mm-hmm. is to actually have a production facility at some point. When Maybe you think a little coffee shop. So. <laughs> oh, I mean, they go together so well, right? Yeah. You've got, you're like Dunkin'. It reminds me of, you know, your Dunkin' and you've got your cookies mm-hmm. and you've got your, you just bring so many great different types of models together. Absolutely. When you think about having started and especially that kind of like, there's again, so many people out there who are like, I think I'm starting a business all of a sudden. I didn't even realize it, you know, but this is so exciting and I'm loving it. And they're just going down that trail for each of you. My question is, what would you say are your top three things that you would tell them? Having been on this journey so far, if you were to pick three things and you got to tell them, what would it be for each of you? You want to go first or me go first? Mm. Um, okay. So my first thing would be to have an emergency fund. When I switched over to this, we went in, I had a full-time job and I was able to save up a lot of money before I switched this full-time to insure. Um, because you constantly want to be reinvesting the money in the business and not paying yourself just so that the business can grow as much as it can. Mm. Uh, second, be, I know it's said over and over again, but be prepared to not sleep. Like it's not, <laughs> not trying to romanticize it. It's not a fun thing, but when you become a duo as opposed to like a huge workload of a team, there's so many different things that you have to do that you might not have realized that you have to do. There's always so much that needs yeah, to be done. there's always something that needs to be done. Um, and then three, you always got to just be optimistic. Remind yourself, you know, is this really what I want to do? If yes, then remind yourself that it's going to happen. You don't know when it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. So you're just going to keep going in every single day. Oh, I love those. And then you have to really, like, trust your inside voice. Trust your gut. Mm-hmm. You know, there will be things that – There'll be really, really, really hard days and it, you'll be tested and then you'll just have a moment of inspiration or something will pop up or a customer message will come in, you know, with with a thankful message that keeps you going, you know, and then you'll also have people that won't believe in you. Mm-hmm. You know, I know that in the beginning we kept, we were told, how's the little cookie yes. bake sale going, you know, mm-hmm. and we had a lot of those sort of comments in the beginning, um, but then there's just a little voice inside you saying, okay, just keep going. It's going to work, you know. And so you just got to kind of listen to your gut no matter what, you know, anyone else tells you to do. If you feel like it's the right way to go, then that's what you should follow. Um, and then third, I guess, although there's always, always, always something else to do, you do have to take a break. Yes. Because if you don't stop to have that reset for yourself, for your mind, for your body, then you're going to start making mistakes. And so you always got to take a day, even half a day, just to reset, you know, do a face mask, uh, watch some garbage television or <laughs> something mindless, because otherwise it, it can drive you nuts how much there is always to do. So I get to, you sound like you're speaking from experience on that one. Have you ever pushed yourself too far? Yes, yeah. we both have. There's been days we've been at the kitchen till like 4 a.m. trying to remake a batch no, that didn't turn out. later than that. Like, we'll usually come in here at like 9 or 10 a.m. There's been multiple times where we've been in here until 9 a.m. or 10 a.m. The, the following mm-hmm. day. It doesn't happen as often as it used it, to. No, That's good. But but it you know, still has happened more times than I would willingly like to admit. Especially when... <laughs> When the next day there's an event. So it's like, you're, you're like, okay, we have to at least go home and sleep for like two hours before we go do this pop-up or go to this market. And then next thing you know, you're home and everyone else is getting up and then you're like, okay, well now I'm on to mom mode. I need to 
start getting, you know, things ready for the day for at home too. So it's, you've really got to just give yourself some grace and just know that you can, you're exactly where you need to be at that moment. And then with time, it'll get time, mm -hmm. but it's, it can be very, um, extensive. I would like to tell a very short story about what I was hinting at earlier about the Thanksgiving um, not so joyous. Oh, our Friday massacre. Yes. Oh um, boy, Friday massacre. Okay, this sounds good. This has turned oh, into a crime podcast yes, now, everyone. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so our first retail stock ever, we came in here the day before Thanksgiving, right? No, it was like a couple of days before. We, yeah. did, we did some test batches to make sure we got our ovens dry because this was our first big bake. Mm -hmm. And it was perfect. We were like, oh, this is amazing. Everyone at the kitchen was like, oh, my gosh, that's what you guys make. Those look so good. And then they cracked it open and it looked amazing. Two days later, we came back to bake for the orders that we had um, for our first. Actually, it was Small Business Saturday is what the delivery was for. So it was the and day Black after Friday. Thanksgiving. Yeah, Black Friday. And I think we lost about. 15 to 20 dozen. Oh, boy. Yeah. yeah. And we had gotten in whatever day it was at 10 a.m. And we didn't leave with nothing in hand, nothing in hand, because nothing worked at all until seven or eight in the morning the next day. And I remember that it was me and my mom and then my brother that is four years younger than me. And he was like, what are you guys doing? Like, what? Like, what's going on? Well, we ended up not being able to fill those first orders. So I had to go to the vendors at 7 a.m. and say, I'm sorry, I'm empty handed. However, you know, we're going to get this fixed. Um, they're like, you haven't went to bed yet? I'm like, no, I haven't went to bed. I don't have any product. I'm so sorry, you know, but we're going to take a nap and then go back and figure out what we did wrong. And then we will have these, your orders fulfilled mm -hmm. by, you know, the end of the day. And, and we did. Um, but that was one of our first lessons that we didn't know as much as we thought we knew. Mm -hmm. um, and that whole first year ended up being trial and error, trial and error, trial and error. And, you know, we've learned not to get too cocky because once we do, then things like mess up. So it was like, okay, we're just going to take everything as we go. We'll just kind of roll with it. Um, we just let the Okokios do what they want. We just respect them from afar. <laughs> In the bags when they come out we say thank you yeah basically <laughs> thank you for coming out today but um it, it gets less and less as you go but the trial and errors are there for the lessons that you need to learn um and we've learned a lot and grown from that and learned different processes as well just from those mistakes i'm curious i mean what a great story like i mean mm -hmm. not i I'm so sorry for that pain, right? Like not a great story. Like, oh my gosh, that's so amazing. Yeah. But what a great real story. I mean, this is, this is real life behind the scenes of businesses, right? And, and when you're doing a, where you're creating a product with your own hands, it introduces some really interesting dynamics. And I think you're really hitting on those. And it makes me think of this question of so often we get asked by business owners, when should I make the leap into my business? Should I wait until I have, in this example, my recipe just completely figured out, totally refined. I've been working in a commercial kitchen for a year and I'm kind of waiting for everything to be perfect and have it all figured out. Or do I jump in and know that I'm going to have some pain along the way? How do you think people should navigate that question? Um, I think that's a different answer for everybody. Yeah. Um, I think it kind of depends on where you are. Um, I think that opportunities presented themselves at a time where I didn't want to say no. And I thought that my recipes were good because at home they were. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like, even when you think you're a hundred percent ready, the, the universe will teach, tell you that you're not after you take that leap. Um, so it's really a, kind of a mixed bag. I think everyone's going to have a different path. And I think when you're the most scared is when you should jump. Mm -hmm. to be Do it scared, right? Do it yeah. scared. When you, it scared. When you are the most fearful, like, oh my gosh, okay, I'm, I'm going to sign these papers. I'm going to sign this contract. We're going to, you know, get started. That's a scary moment because you don't know if it's going to work out. And that's when you just go. 
in my mind. I don't know. What yeah. do you think? Well, that plus I'm a very firm believer and that nothing will ever be perfect. So you can always strive perfect for perfection, but your idea of perfection last year is going to be completely different than what you have this year. So, true. so I always just say to put out your best quality work and then know that it's going to be getting progressively better and better and better. And the more feedback you get, like we work with 13 other small businesses in Kitchen Council. And uh, I, the amount of Okokios that the people in the kitchen have ate is probably absurd because I will go <laughs> over to people with like a fresh cookie and I'll be like, can you give me some feedback? And they're like, I'm like, I don't want to hear it's good. I don't want to hear this. I want to know, was this wrong? Was this wrong? What do you think could be tweaked? You know, and that's the whole thing can about business. Can you taste the main flavor? Yeah. It's usually the big question because we create all of our recipes ourselves. So we're developing our own recipes as we go. And sometimes we'll have a disagreement like our pistachio one, which I brought in I was going to eat, but I didn't have time before it came in. Is a <laughs> pistachio. He likes pistachio a lot. I think it just tastes like almond. But mm-hmm. he was like, it's not pistachio enough. And I'm like, I think it is. And then, so we'd have other people kind of be like, you know, can you can you answer this debate for us? Like, can you solve this? Because we have a different opinion, you know, on things. And so we'll ask people to kind of be that tiebreaker. Um, yeah, that validation piece is so huge. And I'm so glad that you're talking about it because this is, again, one of those areas that when businesses come to us and we do like our one-on-one mentoring with them, I feel sometimes like the bad guy, right? Um, Where I have to say, you love your thing, but no one else does yet, (laughs) right? Like they they don't yet because they have have to learn about it. They have to try it. They have to taste it. They have to integrate it into their lives. In your case, right? Like they get to taste it. So that gives you a sense that they can engage with. But validating with clients and vendors is so important and you can love it, love it, love it. And then be really disappointed when other people give you feedback and then you have to take it back and change it. And I think, especially for us business owners out there who have that creative side, which I would say the baking, I mean, it's creative, right? You're putting your heart and soul into this. And then if you get that feedback, but it's so important to take the feedback and some of the feedback you don't keep because you need a certain uh, cross-section of feedback, right? And so one opinion versus another, but making sure you have a good cross-section and putting yourself out there is so important. So I love that you're talking about that. you got to have thick skin. Mm-hmm. You have to be able to accept the criticism because, I mean, being a gluten-free product, in some markets you'll get bystanders that walk by and say, oh, I, I don't like cardboard, no thanks. Yeah. You know, just because it's the stereotype of gluten-free is not everyone understands it, knows it, needs it, and have the stigma that it's gross, it's going to not be good. So no thanks. So you've already got that hurdle that you're trying to get over. And I think when we started, we had a lot of people asking for dairy-free. A lot mm. of people asked for egg-free. And I'm like, oh, I can't, I can't go vegan. I can't do that. Mm. And then we had enough requests where we ended up doing some dairy-free ones. And then they were like, well, if it's dairy-free, how come it's, why isn't it vegan? I'm like, oh, it's the eggs. And then we figured out how to replace the eggs. And all of a sudden, half of our flavors are vegan. Interesting. After I was like, we're not going to do vegan. But then we got so much feedback and so many requests for, you know, things individually that that combined request kind of, we gradually got to a recipe that worked and You know, that all just kind of happened from that feedback. Hey there, busy to the brim people. Are you feeling overwhelmed with your social media? Well, you're not alone. It's a common challenge in our digital world. Creating social content can be a tricky beast to tame for people like you and I. So I'm popping into my own podcast to tell you that there is a solution and it's called a social sidekick. This isn't just a typical social media content service. We offer a partnership through Tandemworks and our team to take your social media from overwhelming to extraordinary. Having a social sidekick is a game changer for your business. Imagine having a 12-month custom strategy tailored to your brand 
content that's done for you that truly resonates with your audience and growth tactics that actually work for Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. With a social sidekick, you get more than just posts. We're very committed to that. You get a partnership. We're here to help manage your social media with a personal touch, ensuring your message is not just heard, but felt. So if you're ready to take your social media from overwhelming to outstanding, I'd love for you to visit the website, thetandemworks.com slash social dash sidekick dash content dash creation. Don't worry, there's a link in the show notes. And you can discover there how a social sidekick can transform your digital presence. Let's make your digital presence as impactful as your business with a social sidekick where we're amplifying your story one post at a time. Okay, let's jump back in. That's huge. And I love how, I mean, every business owner has to figure this out, right? Because there are some things that you're just going to throw back over the fence and say, appreciate the feedback, but we don't do that, right? Like, um, and you, I think you have to figure out what the purpose and mission of your business is. And in many ways, I feel like, oh, Cookios, you're really looking to fill this void for people to have tasty treats who maybe have food restrictions, right? And you've really honed in on the gluten-free, but it sounds like you have these products that you're starting to play with. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to start making, uh, you know, salads or, you know, like you're going to go completely another direction uh, yet, right? I, we say this and then a year from now, you're like, well, Vivian, we we're actually doing this. Croutons. We have cookie croutons. We have croutons. <laughs> yeah, you never know. That is a possibility. You know, you know, we have been looking at everything bagels. So it's right. Like- but I love how you're identifying at the same time, we have to be careful not to get too married to our thing because I'm pretty sure it's uh, Gary V says it and I'm sure others, but like the market really does decide. And if the market doesn't want what you have, you can enjoy it by all means, but then you don't have a business, right? Yeah. So if you want a business, you have to listen to what the market's telling you to that's true. Try to figure that yeah. out. And that's kind of how we... Our protein content got so high because his brother, one, was a gym rat. And naturally, with the oats and the peanut butter, they had about six to eight grams already. And he was like, you got to beef these up. Mm-hmm. And then next thing we know, we have anywhere from 10 to 17 grams of protein, which is a really high protein content for a baked good. And it doesn't have that um, protein powdery bar taste to Kinda it. Kind of like the chalkiness. Yeah. Uh-huh. So... That was another need. So some people are like, you need to talk more about the high protein versus the gluten free. I'm like, well, the gluten free was why we started it. But, you know, high protein is something else that people need more in their diet, you know, and then you have to worry about there's so much protein that has a dairy in it. But ours is a it's an almond protein powder. So there's no dairy. So that helps those people as well that can't have, you know, whey or those regular proteins. So, you know. Everything by accident, and then some things just turn out to be like what people need or want, and we're like, "Oh, we meant to do that." Of yeah. course. <laughs> now it's a whole new marketing. You know, one yeah, of the things we talk a lot of, with people about is when you have those different product lines, you can still have your core mission, um, but maybe you put together a landing page that's a little more specific to somebody who's looking for the high protein piece, right? And maybe they're using it almost like a like a protein bar in a sense versus maybe like a cookie after dinner type of feel. But you could put together different types of marketing campaigns that target out to certain audiences that still all tie back into your core mission. Um, And that it's something you have to navigate, right? Like some people, they go so, they have a product goes so far in a different direction. It's really a completely different brand and they end up with a whole new website, a whole new everything for two different products. And we've had businesses like that. We have Tandemworks, Mac and V. I've had businesses in the past where we had, you know, five, six different websites, five, six different audiences um, that branched out. But sometimes it's just a matter of a different segmented email list, a different landing page where people can see things that are specific to them. That's always an interesting one to help people navigate. Like when's the right time where we're really making a complete audience switch or can everything live under the same umbrella? I, I love trying to help sort that question out because like you said with some of the other questions for it, it's, you have to figure it out. It's, it depends on the person. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm super curious to know. We haven't talked about this yet. This is a family business. Mm-hmm. Um, you and your boys and Vincent specifically have all been part of it. I mean, you mentioned one of your younger ones like there. I don't know if you ever rope them in. We're like, okay, guys, <laughs> we need more of these packaged or not. But yeah. what has it been like? 
having your family be part of this and really influencing the whole journey of Okukyo's? Um, is that's my favorite part. Yeah. You know, maybe not so much your brother's favorite <laughs> parts, but yeah. um, you know, that's my favorite part when everyone's at the market, like I am like silently like overjoyed, but you know, still being like, okay, I need you over here. I need you doing this or whatever, but they're older and especially having Vincent in the kitchen, mm-hmm. like he, I'm able to teach him how to bake. And now the student's kind of becoming a teacher. He's like trying to check me and be like, no mom, that's not, you need to do it this way. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, that's okay. not how many grams goes you know, in there. It's a little bit yeah. less, actually. It's he, this number. He's like, it's a little dry. I'm like, we don't use that word. No. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think that. Um, and then plus, uh, this Scott, he does a lot of the deliveries, you know. And um, so, yeah, it is our whole household, especially in the summertime for markets because school's out. Mm-hmm. Um, we they, have the six-year-old um, selling samples and cookies. Oh he's like, Do you Oh, perfect. Cookie? Yeah. He's like, do you want a cookie, sir? Yeah. Hi, ma'am. Would you like a cookie donut? And really it's just like this like three foot six year old like running up to you like, would you like? How can you say no? It's simple, right? I know he's a great um, He's salesman. a natural. I didn't have to train him. <laughs> he's just kind of, he'll just go straight up to the, the booth and be like, hey, you want to try this? Come here. It's the best thing ever. Um, so that's uh, that's always fun. But it's nice because they've, they've watched it grow. So they've always had, you should really do this or don't post that mom. That's not what you should post. Mm-hmm. Have Vincent look that over and mm-hmm. you need to change that audio or um, mom. I, they each have their own like speciality mm-hmm. as far as their commentary or their, their feedback, feedback you know, um, about investing or how we should grow or the social media part, you know, so it's, you get to see those little sprouts. Well, they're not so little anymore, but right. it was like those characteristics that you didn't necessarily know that they had hidden under there kind of be like, oh, well, I can see what role you'll play, you know, when you're older, even though you're telling me right now that the same thing, <laughs> I can see what you're going to do, you know, once it does kind of grow out of our hands. How has it changed your family when you think about? Your family before O'Cookios and your family now into the journey of O'Cookios. What's changed? We're a lot busier. Yeah. Um, what else? Um, we're busier. Mm-hmm. I know that. Most of the time we talk about cookies. It's a, a lot more we talk about cookies. Um, <laughs> were you running a business prior? Any of you? Like what were you doing before Okukio's? Me, Vince, I know uh, you said you were working full time. Well, I had my own business when I turned 19, uh, when I was going to UNO for IT innovation. Uh, but during COVID, I decided to stop my studies and to pursue my business full time. Uh, mm-hmm. I was doing Amazon FBA. And then I converted into doing Okukio's full time because I no longer enjoyed really... Um, Selling at Amazon wasn't mm-hmm. really fulfilling, and I always would rather do. I always wanted to be an entrepreneur, but I wanted to do something that was more fulfilling than just you know. You wanted to create. Yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. I remember you saying, "Yeah, what I'm doing, I like what I'm doing, but I would rather do something to where I'm selling something I made, so I can mm-hmm. have that pride behind it." Um, I think that was somewhat the lure that you had yeah. to coming over. Um, I was at home as a mom um, when this started. My youngest was two. Um, so he um, had some health issues. So I was home a lot with him. Um, and then when this kind of grew a little bit, our schedule sort of changed. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, no, we're all busier. Everyone's older. <laughs> and in the summertime, you know, they have jobs if they, you know, don't want to go somewhere else. They're here. Mm-hmm. I think it's crazy. to Built go in jobs. It's great. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. They have stuff to do. When you think about scaling, because you were talking about um, earlier, you were just casting your dream and vision of having your own factory, right? Which mm-hmm. I'm totally going to sign up to come to the tour. 
Yes. Because I love I love touring food facilities. I think they're super fun. Like I said, my grandparents they would took us to like the cheese. There was like the cheese factory, and I've been to chocolate factories and jelly belly factory. All these things they're super fun and fascinating. Yes. Um, it's like a Willy Wonka, right? Mm-hmm. As a kid, you're like, oh, how is it made? It's so cool. Yes. Yes, but it's as you're yeah, as you're thinking about scaling, how do you imagine holding on to that homemade cookie oh cookie oh feel the cookie donut feel as you grow and what you've built into your family as well when you think about that scaling piece what do you imagine there i think the people you surround yourself with um have to have an understanding of what your mission and your vision is if you want to kind of keep that that feel um you have to have people that are just as excited about it as you are um to really keep that going. So I think the people you surround yourself with as you grow are the people that are going to be excited to help you grow um, if you wanna keep that feel. Um, I think another element would definitely be to keep the handmade aspect of the product as long as we can. Because I know a lot of uh, food processing facilities, a lot of machines and like drop shoots and all that type of stuff. So definitely having that incorporated and then as well as keeping the family integrated into it. Um, Like my mom was saying that she feels like we all have our own specialties in a way. Like we joke around that my brother that's four years younger than me. We're like, he's going to be the district sales manager because he doesn't really (laughs) care for baking. But he definitely would be calling up the wholesalers being like, hey, just checking on that pallet we dropped off last week. You know, all that type of stuff. Um, then Jax would definitely be doing social media. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the six-year-old already calls himself the CEO because he named the company. So yeah. Awesome. Ah, yeah, that's good. That's good. He's a boss man. Um, I can see him doing like a lot of the advertising too. But, um, you know, I'm. It's just the timeline. You're like you're like it seems so far away, but where we are today seems so far away when we started. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's like you know I know that's what we're working towards it's just getting all those moving parts to kind of align into those next steps is kind of you know how you map that out i love that as you're mapping things out are there any new flavors coming down the pipeline you're allowed to talk Mm. about yeah well this month we had the new pistachio Mm. white chocolate which is a hit um Mm. thanks to this one i was just like pistachio really like (laughs) But it's good. It's really good, actually. Um, it keeps selling out at all their partners, um, and it's been highly requested. Awesome. And then next month, we try to do six flavors a month. Um, we try to do half vegan and half regular. Sometimes it's two and four, but we try to try to do half and half just to support those people with those restrictions or that lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Um, but next month for April, mm-hmm. even though Easter is in March... Like we try to go by the month, the theme of the month, you know, so St. Patty's Day was this month. So we were trying to get some green in there, but then Easter is the 31st. So it's like, ah, but April, we're kind of looking at some strawberry and cream mm-hmm. or the strawberry lemonade. Um, just a few other kind of more fruity flavors for April mm-hmm. in the spring. Um, we're still working some out, so I don't want to make any promises yet because yeah. we're still doing some research and development, but there are yeah. strawberries in one of them. I I have, awesome. For sure. I have one flavor that I really want to come to fruition, but the last time I did a test batch on it, it was the only one that has yeah. ever done this. It exploded in the oven. Exploded? Yeah. Oh, nice. Exploded in the oven. Um, so Is I've only like done- Pop Rocks in there or something? What's going on? No, I don't know. I think it might have been too much liquid. Um, it's a mango Thai tea. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, right. Um, that sounds so, great. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's, I don't know. I wasn't here the day that it exploded. It so was he was on his own. So yeah. I don't know what he did. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what he did. Mad scientist going on there, too. Yeah, I know. He Just was a like, little bit. All I got to do is add a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I can get it. But it's, it is chemistry. You really have Dude. to. Well, I was just going to ask, since you are so home taught, right? Literally started at home in your own kitchen. Yep. Yeah. Do you pull in any like expert outside resources now where have you taken any classes on recipe development or how do you figure out flavors? Because I know like 
people can really specialize in just flavors and recipe development, things like that. Do you pull no. anything like that in? Um, I don't take classes. Um, I am self-taught. My mom, my grandma, um, just kind of things I learned from them with their little magic powders when they would be in the kitchen, like no recipes ever. They didn't write anything yeah. down. Um, I, I don't want to, I mean, maybe down the line I'll take a class, but right now I, it comes from inside. So like we had our pancakes and bacon flavor mm. in January and that one just kind of came from craving it. Well, actually <laughs> see, my son's plate the last bite of a pancake drenched in syrup with a little bit of bacon left over. Mm -hmm. It's like the mom bite, I guess, sometimes mm -hmm. if you don't really make yourself a plate. Cause totally get it. Yes. You know, bake, you know, making it. And that last bite, I was like, this is such a good flavor. I need to make this into a cookie. So, I mean, that's where the pancakes and bacon one came from. Um, the dreamy was a uh, almond mm. cherry dark, dark chocolate. chocolate. And that was just like, I like, we'll just eat almonds dried cherries and dark chocolate just as a snack. I'm like, this should be a flavor. You know, and like him, he loves Thai tea. He was like, you know, it's just something that you you love to taste. You're like, I want to share this with people. How yeah. can I make this into a flavor that other people can experience? And how can I create that? So that's kind of where the flavors come from. Um, sometimes they make it to the menu and sometimes they explode in the oven. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, they don't. Even sometimes it's suggestions from people mm -hmm. outside of us. Like and there was, fatty. yes, the fatty was uh, in collaboration with the Omaha fatty. It's a uh, chocolate peanut butter Reese's caramelized rice krispies. Um, and he collaborated with us and we made all of his favorite flavors into a cookie. Uh, wow. As well as we've worked with Dan Hoppen and we made him uh, like a dark chocolate mint cookie because that's his favorite flavors. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, that's, that's we're bringing minty back this month, so his is one of the flavors as well as the fatty because Easter Reese's peanut butter cups is like a yeah. must have. So we had both of those this month, and you're going like head to head with the uh, Girl Scout cookies right now, right? Yeah, yeah not gluten free, obviously. So you've got that a little is. different market, but those thin mints, boy, they'll get people. Right. You can eat a whole sleeve of those. <laughs> it's, it's shameful. It's like, it's so right now, off the top of your head, favorite flavor so far for each of you. Oh, it's always a toss up. Um, you know, I gotta go coconut dark chocolate. That's a really good one. That's that's my that's my go to favorite. When there's one extra, I'm always super excited. I'm like, ah, that's mine. <laughs> I, just, I just love coconut and dark chocolate. Um, I've learned since we've had it on the menu that not everyone loves coconut, and I'm mm -hmm. like, how come people don't? I know I'm one of those. I'm not yeah, a coconut like, fan. Yeah. yeah, that and mint, like mint, that and pecans are like three of the things that people are either love or hate. And I was like, yeah. really? I didn't know that. I get to see but that. That's one of my favorites is the coconut. What about mm. you? I would either say red velvet because that one was made for me because my mom had a tradition. As you can tell, she was a very traditional home baker for a very long time. Um, so every year for my birthday, she would make me red velvet since I was like 10. Nice. Um, so she surprised me with red velvet flavor for my birthday like a year or two ago. Very um, cool. So I would say that one's either my favorite. Um, leaning a little bit against it because it is a little bit finicky to bake. It's a pain in the ass. Yeah. <laughs> it's very frustrating, but it tastes so good. It's really good. Um, that one or the pistachio white chocolate. That yeah. is really good. I love pistachios. Until we get this mango Thai tea, then that'll be his next Then that'll yeah. be the new one. It's going to change next yeah. week, so. That's right. No more no more explosions. Yeah, yes. Right. So, my friends, I love to kind of wrap things up with some mm. rapid-fire questions. We get some fun okay. mixed in. We get some serious mixed in, okay? Right. Uh, you could take them both if you want, or if you want to bounce one or the other, totally fine. But my first one is always, what do you think is one of the biggest misconceptions about owning a business? I think more like what your question was, I think having to go to school or having a degree to own a business mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. to be a baker, I think that a lot of people think that they can't do it without that background of education behind them. But life experience is also a really good um, launch pad as well. Huge. I'm with you for sure. Yeah. We get asked a ton, like, what our experience is with being able to just help 
advise entrepreneurs, work one-on-one -on -one with them, do community listings, like all the things that we do, strategy sessions. I just got asked the other day and I said, you know, a lot of it is just through experience. Like we've lived it, we've done it, we've lived it, we've done it, we've gone through the pain, we figured it out, we did it again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah. What about for you, Vincent? What do you think? Biggest misconception? Mm. That there's like a certain amount of time before you start to succeed. I think it's... Mm. I think a lot of people are scared to fail, but we've failed so much in this business. That is what's propelled us to grow so much, so rapidly is so much failure. So I think just like the misconception that there's just, just going to be one thing that's going to help me propel. It's a whole list of failures that have propelled you. Mm -hmm. I love that. Is there a piece of advice that you've been given and you've actually applied into your business? Um, besides keep going, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the good one, yeah, that, just that, yeah, moving. just keep going. Um, you know, you can't let today's failure or no way. What's the one? Don't let perfect be the killer of good. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I'm always, he, he says I'm a perfectionist. a perfectionist and I'm obsessive about, you know, the way things look, the packaging, yeah. the, the placement of the the bow or the finishing aspect of the cookies. I like them to look a certain way. And, you know, before I would 86 things because I'm like, you know what, that one didn't turn out right. Mm -hmm. But it was still perfectly fine to someone who wasn't obsessed about the outcome as I was. So right. don't let perfect be the killer of good or great. Um, and that's one of those things I've had to learn. That's good. I can't think of one off the top of my head. <laughs> I would I would have to think. Yeah. Well, work with your mom. That's great advice. Yeah. Right. Work that with your mom. <laughs> is there something you would tell your younger self? Or if you were to think back when you were still in, in your home kitchen, is there something you would tell yourself knowing what you know now? Um, I think a lot of it would just have to do with pricing. Like pricing mm. out your products, you know, because – chocolate chips at the store versus a 50 pound bag, you know, or just stuff like that, that I wish I would have learned before. Um, I can't think of the specific thing it was, but I know last mm -hmm. week I was like, gosh, if I would have changed this last year, I could have saved this much money. You know, um, there's just things like that, but you know, that comes with that mistake and that learning as you go. So I guess just roll with the punches. Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm your younger self because you're you're so old <laughs> mm, i guess just like i don't know really have faith in like what you believe in if you really want to do it then do it you just have to be very optimistic and roll with the punches mm -hmm. i like this theme like mm -hmm. you're going to fail yeah. yeah, you will. And that whole, you know, people say failing faster because you're going to fail. So the faster you can get to it, the faster you can move on. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it it is true. Like it takes a certain number of failures, if you will, to be able to improve and get better. And if you just sit and wait, the failures don't happen, which means improvement can't happen. Exactly. Well, I mean, it took six months to get the first recipe right. So, mm -hmm. I mean, if I would have quit and said, oh, you know, I guess we're just going to have to use that one-to-one -one flour. Guys, just deal with it. I mean, if I would have just kind of given up then, then we would have never had this 30, what, 30 flavors three mm. years later. I mean, we would have never grown, you know. I mean, I think it's easier to quit. Yeah. The, um, another great example is I went roller skating with my friends last week. <laughs> And half of the, I don't know how to roller skate, nor did like half of them. And my other friends were like just excelling. And my other friends who were scared were like, oh, I don't want to get in there. I don't want to get in there. But like I forcefully made myself get in there and purposely like fall because, you know, it's bound to happen. They're like, what are you doing? Like you're acting like a crazy man. I'm like, the more times <laughs> I fail in the first like 30 minutes, the last 30 minutes, I'll be able to be more comfortable opposed to the entire time on the rink. I'm just uncomfortably standing there. Mm, so nice. Did you make it around without falling eventually um, or no? I did at least once, but it took like <laughs> times falling in front of little children yeah. where they're like just excelling yeah. past me. Yeah. Yes. I'm sure. It's like my I'm skiing. Goodness. 
Yeah, wait till you try ice skating. No, thank you. <laughs> it's, up online. it's even harder. No. When you guys do take that day where you finally like, okay, we're just going to have a little bit of chill time. I'm just going to relax. What is a favorite kickback and relax type of beverage? What are you going for? A beverage? Mm-hmm. Water? <laughs> yeah, I've got to stay hydrated. I, I get a little crazy and have a Coke occasionally. Yeah. I really like smoothies, like a pineapple smoothie with like a little bit of coconut. Or yesterday, um, I had like a date smoothie from downtown that was really good. Just something refreshing, something like that. Yeah. I don't, I don't drink alcohol, so I'm sorry. That one's a little boring. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I ask this, and everyone always thinks that it has to be alcohol. And I'm like, it doesn't. I love tea. One of my favorite things is tea. I love hot tea. Matcha or oolong. If I just want to relax, like morning, night, afternoon, I'll often make myself a cup of tea because it's just like relaxing. I really enjoy that a lot. Definitely. Is there a song, book, or podcast that's inspiring you right now? Um. Do you guys jam out in the kitchen or is it like quiet in there? Well, I do. I listen to like old 90s music. Nice. I have like Offspring or Green Day going on, you know, mm. just, just something fast. Um, that's my productivity thing where mm. I can't hear anybody. I don't have to worry about being distracted. That's right. Um, as far as a book or. Um, mm. I usually listen to podcasts, but it's usually just pop culture or like yeah. just things along those lines. Because for me personally, if I'm working, it's a little bit harder to retain the information about like self-help or whatever it may be while I'm working. And it's kind of just a lot to take in at the same time. It's same mostly, for me. It's mostly background yeah. noise. Yeah. 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 I'm it's really like, into this. Uh, I do Spotify a lot. And there's one mm-hmm. called like, I think it's like just chill house or something like that. I just need kind of like a a beat, right? If people right. are talking, I have no idea what they said. It's exactly. uh, terrible. Michaela, though, she can like listen, retain all this stuff. I'm like, my brain does not split right. into five yeah. pieces like that. It's amazing. Yeah. Especially when you're trying to do math when you're measuring. Oh, yeah. oh gosh. Yeah. yeah. Everything would be exploding in the oven, yeah. right? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I just need just straight music to where it just gives me that pace to keep. Yes. Up. Yes. Hey, as we're kind of wrapping up here, and you're thinking about just business owners in general. How do you think business owners can make the world a better place? By staying in business. Mm-hmm. Um, I think offering, like the world needs whatever it is that you have. You know, and if you haven't found your people yet that, that need your product, you know, you just need to keep, keep you know, promoting it and looking for that, that piece, that missing piece. Because I think the world needs new things and yeah. they mean something to be excited about um i think to dance about one. yeah to mm. dance about to be happy yes when they see something they're like oh my gosh i can i love that whatever thing it is especially like when vincent mm. said our customers that get super excited that like fuels you so it's just keep doing what you're doing you know the world needs whatever it is that you have you have something special so just keep giving it I think another important one would be to be kind and stay kind Um, because I know a lot of the times like starting out entrepreneurs or especially since we work with 13 other small businesses when people are entering the kitchen for the first time and I'm like, oh my God, this was literally us two years ago where they're like freaking out or like worried about X thing and then like, you know, you just got to reinforce it with kindness, you know, take their questions. But there's definitely been times where I've experienced not so great conversations with people that I might have took inspiration from Mm -hmm. um, that have been an entrepreneur or running their own food business for a while. And it was someone you looked up to. And it wasn't a great experience. So I think just being able to be kind and um, really trying to help everyone um, grow because at the end of the day, you're doing the same thing. No one is your competition. Everyone is collaborating on making the world a better place. So. I love that. Yeah, yeah so good. Yeah. There can be so much petty competition, and, and it's be. no good, right? Like healthy competition, a little, a little bit is good when you're spurring each other forward. But yeah, with you for sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hey, if somebody wants to get a hold of some oat cookie O's, mm-hmm. how can they go about doing that? And if they are listening and not in the local area, as many of our listeners are, is there any chance of them getting a hold of an oat cookie O, or do they need to hang tight until you start? broader distribution so 
Currently, you can check out our website at www.okukios.com, as well as we have our phone number listed online. Um, And currently, we have 30 retail partners spanning from Lincoln, Fremont, uh, Nebraska, and then Avoca, and then Trainer, Iowa. And then um, we also ship across the entire United States except Hawaii and Alaska. All right. Um, so hang tight, Hawaii and Alaska. Coming yeah. your way. <laughs> um, yeah, you can find all that information on our website. Um, and you can place an order on there as well. We deliver free locally on Fridays. Perfect. So orders received by Wednesday are delivered on Friday. And if somebody is interested in carrying your product, is that an option? Are you still taking um, retail spaces, wholesale and things like that? Um, we're always open to the inquiry. Um, we do have a wait list right now, Mm -hmm. um, but they can always reach out, send an email and just give us their information and, um, we can always get a hold of them when we're able to expand. Perfect. I love it. When you're expanding and the factory comes and then you're going to be franchising before you know it, if that's a model you want to go with. I love it. Well, Nicole and Vincent, thank you for coming on, especially coming on together. I think it's always fun just to hear like the different perspectives. And thank you so much for just the inspiration. I know I feel inspired too of that, like, hey, it's okay to fail. Um, Get out there, fail a little bit faster. And I think I have to tell myself that sometimes, right? Like, be sure to get out there and do that. So I appreciate that. You gotta get over, you know, that, oh, I failed and, you know, you can't beat yourself up. You just gotta keep going. That's right. I love it. Well, thank you so much. And we're gonna have to check back in as you guys continue to expand. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. All right, bye. Bye.